Um, all right, so I'm Ben. Um, I'm the CTO of Mighty Games. Matt, we're, this is Mighty Games, of course. Um, well, we're Mighty Games, I should say. Um, previously, I worked at Tin Man Games, so Tin Man Games, people here. Um, that was rad. Uh, I came from the film industry, where I did a lot of sort of uh, industrial control. I worked on giant high-speed robots, um, flying cameras, basically. And uh, sort of in that process, I became to really enjoy automation, the idea of automation and automating things. Um, I, before that, I was in the dot-com way back. Some of you are probably not even old enough to remember the dot-com, but it was a thing, and then it crashed. Um, and apparently, I, have an, oh, I do have an Academy Award. Matt yeah, likes to put that I always in. put that in, because Ben actually does have an Academy Award. Yeah. From the film industry, automation work. Yeah, it had nothing to do with games. No. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Matt Ditton. Uh, yes, our name's Ryan. Yes. Not on purpose. Yeah. Ditton, Britton, Kitten, Mittens. Yep. That's what it is. Um, this, this is getting close to my 20th year in games. I started at Chrome way back in the day. I worked at Pandemic. I uh, ran a games degree at Griffith. There are some of my students here, and I'm very sorry. I don't know if there are any... No, none of them are in the room. Nice. Excellent. Phew. Good. And, um, and I came to Melbourne and I founded a company called Many Monkeys. And then at that time, then I met Ben while he was doing Tin Man. And um, our names rhymed, so we started a company. Yeah, it was important. Yeah. It was important. Um, so there's 80 slides in this. There's 50 minutes. We're going to go pretty quickly um, because we want to throw some questions at the end. Um, so that said, if you, could, like, if you have questions about this, obviously we're around. Come talk to us. Tweet, tweet us, email us, whatever. We're happy to take questions. Uh, and there's also this amazing microphone over here. So when we get to the question time, uh, we have to get you the microphone because yeah. it's like a thing. Yeah. I think they're recording it maybe. Who knows? Yeah, but it's recording. No, it's, it's, be it's fine. Anyway, to the topic. So, so always be testing. Uh, that's the name of the topic. But really what we're talking about is uh, better development through the use of robots. Um, specifically, we are talking about these products that we've developed at Mighty over the last five years that we accidentally made um, called the BuildBot and the TestBot tool. And uh, this, is our, this is our clickbait title. Yeah. Yeah. So the clickbait title <laughs> of the talk is AI Driven Production Ops. It's like the best bit of technical word salad we could think of. Right. So It's like live ops, but before you go live. And actually, while you're live as well. But this is like live yep. ops for your production team. Fundamentally. Yeah. Um, so, two parts. BuildBot. BuildBot is a all-you-can-eat uh, from repo to platform build service. Um, as many builds as you want, uh, any platform you can ship on. And then the TestBot. The TestBot is an AI testing tool. This is where the AI, come, AI comes in, the TestBot. Yeah, AI. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that is a whole game testing philosophy. Uh, launches your game, and then hammers the living hell out of it. We'll get to that. Um, so, to begin with, a little bit of background story. Uh, we'll talk about making games, and we're going to talk about the shitty parts of, of making <laughs> games. Um, so, background is important. The background information uh, comes from two major projects that we worked on, uh, Disney Crossy Road and Piffle. So, Disney Crossy Road... Um, was 12 months in development. We only had a team of 10 people. It was a game uh, put together by three different companies, so us, Hipster Whale, and Disney. We shipped on two platforms, um, but <laughs> it was very complicated in the fact that we had to deal with every single licensing section in Disney because we were dealing with every single piece of Disney IP. Who's worked with Disney? You probably can't say. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love you. Love your work. Yeah. Uh, we understand your suffering. Um, wonderful company. Very strict. So, uh, there was this very technical and very security-focused uh, sort of problematic uh, issue that we had to solve, which was this, like, this builds channel. And then the second, the second game that really brought this to the fore was Piffle. Now, Piffle is sponsoring the coffee cart today. Uh, please enjoy the coffee. Enjoy Piffle Coffee. Yep. Uh, Piffle for the Switch will be coming out at some point. Don't worry about that. Um, that might be secret. It's on the coffee cart. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no one tells me anything. If it's meant to be secret, it's a bit fucking late. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Um, but it's a block breaker. It's a free-to-play block breaker. There's like 500 plus levels. We had this uh, constant shipping. So across the year of its... Uh, 
uh, soft launch and launch, we, we shipped every Friday. So um, there was basically a new build on the store every single Friday, iterating constantly. Um, and it was a core team of five. So yeah, so we, we built, I think we shipped with like 300 levels. <clears throat> tons of features, tons of meta. There was only five of us. There's really only sort of really three main people who are full time. Yeah. The other two of us were sort of like half ish time. Yeah. And then like an attack squad of like something's broken. Like everyone in. Yeah. Sort this out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, basically the build and test system basically allowed us to meet that schedule. Yeah. But that's okay. We're going to tell you about that. Yeah. So the beginning is we're going to talk about these builds. So the, the walkthrough history lesson here comes from um, Mighty. So, so here is Mighty Games, uh, lovely indicated by this clip art. And uh, the situation occurs when Hipster Whale walks in the door. Yo, Andy. Up, and man? Hipster Whale says, yo, how about Disney Crossy Road? And we're like, oh, that like sounds it. cool. Yes. How good is this? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, we're on board. So the train begins. So we have this first problem. The first problem is we have to make a game, and we have to get it on iOS. So to del deliver on iOS, we're like, sweet. No worries. Release, dev, test flight, we're away. That's awesome. However, we're working with hipsters, so they need a copy of the build. So then we have to get the builds with, onto their certs. With their devices and their certs. Yeah. Fine, no worries. <laughs> That's all cool, no worries. And then Disney's like, by the way, uh, we're in the title. So we need to give them builds. So it's like, okay, cool, no worries, we're up to nine, this is easy. And then Disney's like, oh, by the way, there's a whole QA department, so they need certs and they need builds. And the, oh, there's two lots of them because there's a lot of people and there's only 100 devices on the cert, so we need multiple certificates. Back when there's only 100 devices. Yeah, back when there's 100 devices. <laughs> like, sweet, we can do this. Oh, yeah, no, there's a third one for release. We're like, great, no worries. Oh, and yeah, there's metadata for the store and every single language is translated and every single screenshot's translated and every single whatever the hell, like videos were all translated. Everything, yeah, everything. everything was translated because, you know, it's a big world yeah, and everybody and loves Disney. Yeah. So we're like, sweet, no worries. So we just set up this system where we would build all these things and we'd distribute them out to whatever channels people needed them. So we were Slack and iTunes and Hipster was Slack and iTunes and Disney was Box and Box is great. And it's really secure and it's awesome. Like it's a really <laughs> awesome platform and it's great to work. It's great to send builds to Box, it's awesome. Uh. <clears throat> now that was only iOS. In fact, that's uh, that many builds on iOS. So moving forward, we then had to get it on Android. We had to get we had to get it on Google Play. We had to get it on Amazon, and then we had to do our own builds internally. For, You're actually uh, forgetting the Fire TV and the Apple TV and the Stick oh. and the whatever. Anyway. You could have brought that up when I, I was forgot. making the slides. Tell just now. Right, anyway, so yeah, there were... <laughs> I blocked it out. <laughs> yeah. So we had this problem where we basically had to, from the repo, generate this huge number of artifacts of builds. Um, and there's not a lot of us, and there's not a lot to work on. So what we ended up building was we used the build machine to solve these problems. You know, 33 build targets, major builds every... Or minor builds every 15 minutes. We were doing QA builds every night delivered. Um, every week would be release builds delivered. It was 12 months from start to finish, and then we had a every month ongoing update cycle across the next 15 months. Yeah, and so I mean, sort of the the sort of way we sort of approached this is we, you know, this is back before Unity Cloud Build existed, right? We were basically building our own cloud build. We sort of started with Jenkins, um, but Jenkins is it's Jenkins, it's fine. It's like a glorified cron job runner, basically. You know, um, so it didn't really do what we wanted. That's fine. So we basically built on top of Jenkins a configuration system to basically be able to configure all these different build targets because in Unity, obviously, you've got like, I got iOS and I've got one set of things for iOS, but we've got like 12 iOS build targets I got to build to. So we built, so basically built a configuration system and built our sort of, you know, continuous integration Unity build tools. So they pull from our configuration system, set all the player settings in the build as they go and build it out. It's like, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of people doing this sort of thing, but this is sort of how we got that started and we sort of had to do it. And the exciting thing was we basically were doing probably 100, maybe 200 builds a day and our build machine, we had like a, a Mac Mini that we, were, we had started with, and it was fine for a little while, uh, but we literally destroyed that machine. Like, turns yeah. out Unity has lots of little files, and we, we ruined the, the hard drive in that machine. We took it into the, to the Apple store, and they said, we've never seen anything this bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. It was like, we need to take a screenshot of this because we've never seen, we've never seen a hard drive yeah. more destroyed. Yeah. Like, and like, be because, of, because of this sort of build sort of, you know, velocity, we actually bought two giant Mac Pros at the time, um, and just stacked them full of memory and, and hard drives. So we there basically is, meet look, these targets. I, I will admit there's nothing more satisfying than you go on to the Apple store and you, you pick the Mac Pro and you literally pick the highest you thing click, in the click, whole click thing. Everything, I want everything. And then you just buy it. And you're like, like that is really expensive. Okay. Yeah, it's like 
like it hurts, like it hurts a lot, but it's really satisfying. So yeah. Um, yeah. So we went from one Mac Mini to two Mac Pros, and we went from like hundred dollars a day to like seven hundred dollars a day. So it was great. Yeah. So the Buildbot tool is this like continuous integration structure that we have that basically is like if you check it in, there's a build. Not only is there a build, there's like any platform you want, any configuration you want, anything you want, anything any way you want to put it, it just does it. Yeah, so it's not, it's not just builds, it's sort of like, it takes the build, it's a bit more, it take, takes the build, packages it up into whatever, OTA, or test flight, or Google Play, or whatever, and, and, and puts it there. So if I run a test flight build, it'll make the build and then put it on test flight for you. You know, so you're not, basically, no one should be pressing buttons at all. It all happens automatically every 15 minutes, checks the repo, oh, I needed 70 builds, great, let's go. Fires them all off, and then 15, 20 minutes later, you've got builds everywhere. Yep. So. Um, and it, it looks incredibly boring. So um, <laughs> check it out. This is, our, this is our sweet uh, website design skills. Think back to Fatboy Slim. Yeah, yeah. So just, just imagine it's really more exciting. But the, the beauty of it is you actually want it to be insanely boring. All you want to know is that builds are happening and they're turning up. So it looks a lot like this. Um, the toolbots are this like, we have this problem where because we build something called buildbot and we build the testbot, we call everything something bot. So you're going to hear that a lot. Sorry. Um, <coughs> But the toolbot's like a front end to the way that the whole system works. But you can you can deal with it on a number of different fa number of different communication channels. So it's got a heavy uh, Slack integration. So you can actually just ask the build machine, like, "Hey, what's your status? Oh, great, build this build for me." And then it just goes through and just like drops it into the drops it into the channel. You should make its own channels because it just like the bots yeah. just pollute the hell out of it. Yeah, but it's so it's fun. nice. So like you know, I I work on Cam up in Canberra quite often, so I work from there. So I'm remote, and I just like pull up my phone. Like build happens in Melbourne. I pull up my phone, go to the build channel, grab that next iOS build, download my my, my phone, I play it. You know, yeah. it's like it's like a five minute round trip. You know, from build starting to me playing the game. Yeah, and uh, this this was not actually orchestrated. Uh, Patrick, in fact, was happy that the quick build turnaround did occur. So um, I just That's had to. In case you're wondering, Patrick Ewing, um, NeoCab. This is all NeoCab stuff. So we worked on the NeoCab Apple Arcade stuff, which was really great. Um, great game. You should all go down and play it. But we're going to talk a lot about NeoCab, so just so you know the context there. Yeah. Um, and then every, every build makes this artifact. So this, this, is, this is basically when you click those links and go to those builds, uh, this, this is kind of what you get. So we've got an OTA build here at the top. You just click on it, downloads on your phone. And then there's the build report. And the build report simplifies the Unity output to basically go, here's the size of all your assets. So for God's sake, just optimize those yeah. sh shaders. And this like, is actually super helpful. Like um, Neo NeoCab is a, I mean, we're talking a lot about NeoCab, but um, we ported it to iOS and, and tvOS and, and Mac. And it was basically designed originally to be on PC, right? Um, and then Switch. And so they had lots of huge assets and stuff. So we actually used this build system to basically really optimize the assets. This build report is a pretty boring one. But if you, if you run like a full asset bundle build, it will show you every single asset bundle and, and basically sort by, by size to the top. So you can go, oh, right, there's an 11 meg shader, right? So we should fix that, you know? And like the original ones were like, the first ones were like 64 meg textures and things like that. So anyway. Yeah. So, um, you know, we like yellow. It's just a problem. Um, but this is a bit of a diagram to kind of indicate uh, the way in which DCR kind of functions. So of the three companies at the top, you know, the build bot represented by this convenient little character wearing a hard hat uh, is monitoring the repo. Changes happen and then out comes the artifacts. So across to all platforms if necessary. And then they're delivered. So Slack is the way do we talk internally to everybody so all the people get Slack notifications. We don't get, we actually turned off all the notifications because it's incredibly annoying, but they're there if you ambiently want them. Um, and then they deploy out into the system and then also deploy up to box. <laughs> right. Um, now, no one's going to get that joke. No. It's fine. Now, the, piece we ha the bit we haven't discussed yet is this little piece at the side. So this is the testing system. So once the builds are done, it also deploys out into the testbot harness. Now the testbot harness, uh, oh yeah, sorry, we should talk about this. We talk about testing. So I mean, that, that's fundamentally, that's, that's the build bot. Now the build bot is fairly boring. It's uh, like everyone here knows how to make builds. You've all made builds, maybe, I don't know. But you know, it's a solved problem. Everything we're talking about there, these are solved problems. The only difference between our system and say another system you have internally is that ours is already built. And we can do it cheaper than you can, and it's fast, and we have the capacity. Um, fundamentally, it's the most boring part of your job, right? 
is, is building. And oftentimes, if you're on a team, small team or big team, your lead engineer is the one who's spending time doing builds, right? The most expensive person you have probably is the one who's wasting their time pressing buttons, doing builds, shuffling packages from the build machine to iTunes or trying to upload to Google, whatever. So yeah. the, the, whole, the whole reason that we automated this way, I mean, was originally because we had so many build targets, it was impossible for one human to do it. Um, but in the end, even when we're just doing one game with just our own build targets, it's so much faster, you know. The programmers don't even worry about builds anymore. You just check stuff in. You, you, you're in Unity, you check it out, you're playtesting, you're fixing stuff, you check it in, builds just happen. You know, so you're not paying your most expensive and probably most valuable programmer person to deal with these things that are solved problems. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So test plot is the actual interesting part. Yeah. So <laughs> Builds are really boring, but we solved that, so, you know, whatever. Yeah, let's so why on. would you do it? <clears throat> um, so, the test bot. So, let's just talk a little bit about um, the, the, the process of how this works. So, builds occur, they go out to whatever platform you want. From that, they're handed off to the test bot. Now, the test bot is a, uh, fundamentally, it's an app. It runs on a PC or a Mac or Linux if you want it. Linux if you want it. I don't know why, but that's fine. Um, and it stands up an instance of your game. So we make custom versions of your game that know how to play themselves, basically. Um, at build time, we inject the test bot code into your code, and then the game stands up, and it just starts playing itself, right? That's the broad overview. <laughs> now, the key here is that it plays a lot of your game, right? As much hardware as you've got ambiently sitting around is as many builds as you would like to get up and start playing the game. It's probably worth noting really quickly that we tend to use Macs and PCs as the sort of test harnesses because we can run multiple instances at once on each machine. We'll talk about that. But we can also, because the, the, the build, the, the sort of test bot code lives in your code, so we can basically build test bot builds that will play themselves for any platform. So you want to run your test bot on iOS, TVOS, P PS4, Xbox, whatever, whatever platform you're delivering to, we can deliver a test bot build to that platform and run the test bot on that platform. So it's handy for things like TVOS with NeoCab. We would just kick the test bot off on our two Apple TVs and let it run and time how long it took for them to crash for memory errors, right? <laughs> and then we would know, oh, it got this far. That's great. Let's go fix some more stuff. And then until it finally became where they would just run all night and not crash, and then we're like, great, solve memory problems. Yeah. You know, and you don't have to have a person sitting there play through the game to get to that point. You just let the test bots run until they run out of memory. And you're like, great, that was an hour and a half. Awesome. Let's fix that yeah. bug. I mean, the other interesting side effect of that is that, you know, there's a bunch of interesting um, <clears throat> cloud solutions from, like, Amazon or Google that will, like, just stand up multiple versions of your game across, like, massive native device hardware. But the problem is that it doesn't Their testing tools are garbage. <laughs> you can't say that because I know there's a guy from Google in the room. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. It's, <laughs> hey, yo. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's more that it doesn't know how to play the game to find the problem. So, the, the value of a test bot build is that you stand it up and then it starts playing your game. And if you're using those kind of services where you're going to like throw it through like the cloud yeah. or someone else's computer. Anybody's device farm or I can't the Google one's called, but yeah. Yeah, then it's like you've got this like massive amount of coverage that you, no one can normally have. Yeah. So, that's kind of cool. So, the build bot will sit, the test bot will sit there and start testing, and then errors will be found. And then those errors then get distributed out to your team in artifacts that are useful. So, for example, you know, this is NeoCab. Um, it's out on Apple Arcade. Everybody get a subscription. Also out on Switch and Steam and Switch and Steam. We're pimping Apple Arcade at the moment, so yeah. Sorry, just yeah, like, whatever. Yeah, stop that, Ben. Just let people know. Um, it's good. So what we have here is like, this is actually part of the artifacts that are generated out of NeoCab. So these, every single GIF here is a crash. You sort of see the, like at the, at the end of this GIF, this little error, that little, you know, console da, 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 error da, da, da. And it pauses so you can read it and go, oh, okay. Yeah. And so, so when an error happens, it creates a GIF of the last 15 seconds or whatever of the game, so you know how the error was created. And then has the thing there and then. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> And so uh, Ben tweeted this out like a little while ago. This, oh, right. this was, yeah, so I made this slide 10 minutes ago, so it doesn't quite work, yeah, and so now I, I feel bad. I tweeted yeah. this on Saturday as a way to pimp this talk. Um, I, was just, I was just actually in the office, and I was like, oh, yeah, I was doing some work on NeoCab, and so I just fired up Tour of Test Bots, running 18 instances, and um, NeoCab is a great game because there's no physics, so I can run it at, at multiple, I can run it at like 5x or 10x speed. So I was running these at 5x speed, and I was like, oh, I wonder how much that actually is. So I started doing the math, and I'm like, oh, okay. That's like 90 hours of testing for every clock hour, which is basically a month of testing in the eight hours I was in the office. I did a month of gameplay testing on those two games. And on, on the game. And as you can see by our uh, salubrious uh, conditions there and uh, the IKEA, you know, 
shelving, uh, you know, no expense is spared right. in, in testing your game. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think the other thing I did is like over the course of the entire NeoCare project, which up to this point is about three months, we probably clocked about 10, uh, about 100,000 hours of testing, which is about 12 years worth. Yeah, so. Um, and so, uh, to, to the bug reporting section, like, you know, the game crashes and error curves, you, can, you see it on the screen, you can log into the bot and go, hey, give me the, give me the bugs. And so what you end up with is this artifact here. And so this is a bug report. The bug report hangs around. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's a secure link that sits on AWS. You can throw it into JIRA or, you know, what, whatever kind of like... Whatever you're using to do your... Whatever you're tracking. using to sort out your tracking. And it's like gives you the... Here's the error log. Here's where we think the crash occurred. Here's a visual GIF to show you when it happened. Screenshots of the game. And then like here's the full logs. So you can go through and get everything you need to solve the problem. And what, like, so every, every different sort of instance of the test, but you, you can configure it to do all sorts of things, right? We can do time lapses, take a screenshot every, every second of the whole entire gameplay. This one's got, this one's really a proof button, so it's proof there. So that Unity log file actually has the logs, it has all the game saves, it basically has all the relevant state for that game at the point that this bug bot was created. And that just packages up, zips up, sticks on S3 in a secure bucket, grab that link, put it in Jira, and then, you know, a month later, you can come back and it's all still there and you can figure out what the problem is. You know, and it's like all the logs are right there, they're ready to go. You can see the GIF, you know how it's created the game, you're like, oh, this one did a thing, and then I got this stack trace that caused that. You know, it's super convenient to like find bugs. It just makes finding bugs and fixing bugs immediately fast. So the, the, the thing to think about here is in terms of like coverage size across your game, uh, or games if you're a studio with lots of games. Um, so there's like this, uh, <clears throat> this is the, the toolbot. The toolbot, thank you. This is basically the toolbot that will show you what's occurring on all of the test bot instances that are inside or outside uh, your network. It is irrelevant how many test bot instances you have. If you've got spare hardware, just set them up. We don't care. That's really not the point. Yeah. Um, but it will, it's your way to view in to go and find that machine and tell me what's, uh, tell me what's going on. For example, this is, this is Mighty Test 20 that was running uh, the nine up instances of NeoCab. So you can basically watch in a web page like things occurring at the same time. Yeah, and you can just hit the bug bot button like, oh, I see there's, there's a red error on whatever, game eight. Hit the bug bot button, Jira it's a bug bot, puts it in Slack, cut and paste it, Jira, off you go. Or just, you know, fix it. Um, and from a like, isn't this shit cool standpoint, this is what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, it, we, Ben, uh, a thing I've found out about Ben over the years of dealing with him is he has a fetish for old computer hardware. <laughs> and uh, so we've just never thrown anything away. So it's all become uh, test bots in the office. Yeah. The great thing about, like, this is Piffle, it's a mobile game, so it has to be really performant on low-end devices, which means our decade-old Mac minis can run three instances of it at once. So this is, these, these are mostly Mac minis running this. You can see one in the, in the corner there. Um, yeah, like, <clears throat> mobile games are great because I can run a million of them at once on really shitty hardware. Um, NeoCab is a little, little more performant, which is why it was on the PCs. Uh, but yeah. The great thing about having shitty hardware is that it forces you to make a game that works. Because if, if, you're, if you're testing on a high spec, you just, you just get really, really lazy. Yeah. So. And one thing you can't see here because it's too low res, but like, because the test, because the auto tester is running inside your code, we have all these overlays you can turn on. We can show like what the controller is doing or what the FPS is, all stuff. So you can actually just go flip the FPS on all those machines and go, yep, I'm running three up on a Mac Mini, and it's only getting 26 F FPS. So that's bad, right? Yeah. And you can fix it. Yeah. Um, so. This is the point in the talk where we talk about a very specific use case. Like so a, this sorry, case study. This is the case study that we have of uh, NeoCab. It's on Apple Arcade. It's free for one month. You should play that. It's great. It's like the Netflix for games. Um, oh yeah, no, there's a one year. We're only 24 minutes in. We gotta slow down. We're going slow. I did the same thing. I did this similar talk at <laughs> NZGDC a couple of uh, like like a month ago. You have so much time for questions. Yeah, great. I did it. I did the whole thing in like 18 minutes. So Ben's really sucking up a lot of time. Sorry, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so NeoCab is an interesting problem because uh, this is a multi-path visual novel. You got 60 different character interactions which have all of these amazing branches. So you got 2100 branches. There are 17 separate languages. Um, it launches on. Uh, iOS, TOS, Mac OS, and then PC. iPad OS, and yeah. Yeah, and then like, you know, Steam, Mac and PC, uh, Switch. Yeah, so it was a simultaneous launch across basically uh, everything that could run a game. 
which was simultaneous over a month, which is how they are nowadays. Yeah. So, <laughs> and um, the 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 target release platform of Apple Arcade was like, well, we're kind of making this up as we go along, so how do we make this work? Um, and then also, because it was the one-shot launch, like, we couldn't patch it. We had to make it work. So there's no, there was no, you couldn't have a problem here. Um, so one of the large, uh, one of the large things that we implemented across this, because there is so much text, it is a game that has a ridiculous amount of text, uh, was we, it, you utilize this system called the proof bot, which we developed for Piffle. So the proof bot will go through and take a screenshot of every single string in your game. It's basically like it's the auto tester test bot, but running a special AI script that just finds every unique string in the game and takes a screenshot. Yeah, so what we have here at the bottom, like this is Japanese, and you can see that like this one to the left, the Japanese carriage returns uh, are wrong. Which always okay. happens. Which, which, is, which is like, this will only be found an hour into the game. No, longer. So this would actually, be, it would take, like, that particular interaction would only like occur. like day four. Yeah, like day four into the game, uh, playing that narrative panel. In Japan, because we would never know. In Japan. The, and this, the, the one you're showing is traditional Chinese. Oh, I'm sorry. very sorry. There you go. Very sorry. Okay, yep. See, here's the problem. I can't read it. <laughs> like, I don't know. This is a language and it looks like crap. That's the problem. Not the language. The language is a great language. Sorry, that's not what I meant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, that does not look right. Fucking this up. Great. Good now, job. so... <laughs> so what we ended up making were these giant proof sheets for the very skilled language translators who worked on this game. Um, and these proof sheets were these massive documents that basically contained, like, here's the English version and here's the translated version. And then here's the string key. So you can see the English version, what it should say. You can see the translated version so you know what it looks like in context. And if it was messed up, you know what the string key is, so you can go into the, 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 the document and find it. Right. So you had this, like, super easy to pass, contextually relevant information to the people that needed it at the time in order to get the translation right in the context that they had to see it when they didn't have to sit there and play the whole game for four days to find this broken panel. Right. right. And with Piffle, because Piffle's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a prog progression-based game, if you did play the game for 12 days, you would see every string, generally speaking. But with NeoCab, that's not the case, because it's a nonlinear narrative, and there's huge, you know, it's computationally intensive <coughs> branching to see every string, you know. Yeah, so you have this problem in NeoCab where there's these conversation paths. So what we, what we made was basically, here is a proof of the conversation path that's going to happen across every single language. And so what we, what we did was like across this, this, these computers that are running the proof bots, they run them every single day. They're dropping out just gigabytes of data into like these indexed buckets of like conversation trees. And then once that's done, we then reassemble all of that into these like logical proof sheets that then go out to the translation team and we go, does that work? Does this look right? Like, it's, it's probably worth noting that NeoCab, when they came to us sort of three months before launch, they hadn't started localization at all. Yeah. The you interesting know. thing is, like, that was before we actually fixed yeah, it. Yeah, it was like, I think it was like 14 or 16 languages. I can't remember in the end. Um, and we managed to basically get all of them done, except Arabic, tragically, but that's coming, um, in for release. Like, you know, and this one of the things where they had never planned to localize it because they had just built it, this awesome indie game for themselves, yeah. and then suddenly they're like, this has to be in 16 languages, which is one of the reasons they called us, because we know how to do this. And they're like, we can help you, our bots can help you do the work, <laughs> kind of thing, you know. And so yeah. we were able to really quickly iterate on, you know, 12 squillion strings across all these languages with the localization company, which was Riot, who were quite good. Um, not, yeah. Not that Riot. Different Riot. The Riot it's localization. Another Riot. Yeah, sorry. You should um, talk to them. They have the same name. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, was, it actually was like you know, fairly painless. I mean, you know, localization is never painless, but relatively speaking, it was painless. <laughs> well, for, you know, the inside baseball in that is that, you know, it's based on ink, like, you know, the Inkle, Inkle script. Yeah. And uh, if you know that, that was never meant to be translated. Like, that was, that <laughs> it's was all YAML files everywhere, all sorts of crazy stuff. But yeah, so it's, it's, it's an interesting process. So what we built for Chance Agency w w was this structure where... Uh, it, you know, we have this like multi-location test bots where, you know, the artifacts go out and they go out to the test bot system. Internally at Mighty, we were running like multiple instances across multiple computers every single day to pull out all these proof bots. But then we also had 
um, test bots running in San Francisco with Patrick, who was sitting there watching the game and finding bugs, as, as you know, without having to deal with the, the proofing problem. Um, so it was uh, this interesting solution that resulted in these like just insane numbers, where you know we were running. 24 instances, five hour play speeds, 10 hours a day. You end up with this, you know, 1,200 gameplay hours per day tested with like 1.4 million images. It generates like 189,000 proof sheets, which is just, you know, it's hard to comprehend. But then the, you know, the, and then that's like 148 calendar hours of proof bot. That's like, that's per day. So, so every single day we would run this in order to re, you know, basically recheck the game and make go sure through every single branch it could find and take a screenshot of every single string in the game and then yeah, so stitch it all together, find the dupes, go, well, I took 80, 80 shots of the first one. Yeah. I just only need one of those, you know. And like, it sounds like an awful lot of work, but it was really like, once it's set up, it's just like, build more robots, like away it goes, like it just does its thing, it's automated, it's happening, and then it's like, it's just this, at that point, it's a total iteration tool, and it's just... Yeah. It's every, just tw every 24 hours, you get a five gig drop of like, here's the proof sheets. Yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> so it really just hammered our AWS, really. It was awesome, we paid a lot yeah. for that. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I asked Patrick for a quote, so he's like, um, I would never make a game again without this. That's my favorite saying, that's pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, um, and then I, Told you I was going to quote it, so that was good. Um, but it's a you know it's this it was a really strange problem that sounds like all oh, right. Well, you know if we just took a screenshot every time the string came up, maybe that'd work. And you're like sure, but then the, <laughs> the logistical nightmare is just like yeah. computationally quite quite painful. Um, now the next thing here is we want to talk about uh, we we do a bunch of work with Mighty Kingdom, and so. Um, we were helping them with Chop Chop, which is uh, the greatest Conan game ever. Absolutely. Um, just FYI. And um, Chop Chop had this really interesting situation where it's like, you know, Mighty Kingdom is a big company. They've got a whole bunch of people. But at the same time, there's a whole bunch of stuff riding on it. It's a large IP. You're dealing with an external publisher. They have limited team resources. It's a multiplayer game. Um, it's roguelike, there's these procedural elements, um, it has to launch on everything at exactly the same time. You know, from a, from a team resource standpoint, it, you know, they came to us and were like, could you just make a lot of problems go away? And like, <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. So we built them this, and it looks a lot like the other ones, but it has this, uh, a couple of extra features in it, and that this is mostly for consoles. So the mobile section is, we don't worry about that. Um, so this is all consoles uh, for all of them, and um, still we're pushing out to Slack. We have a conjoined team Slack where we're sending them everything they need, and then we we built um, we built the Jira packages so that it's like here you go, here's your assets. You can like file bug reports when you need to in, in whatever. Um, but then we run a a, a co-location testing system. So they have a test wall. Uh, albeit not as awesome as ours. Uh, it's early days. Over in Adelaide. Uh, they're going to get an awesome one. We're going to yeah. sort that out. And um, then, you know, we have the testing system here. So we, it was this, like, two eyes solving the problem of, like, is this game working? And, it, you know, it's, it's a pretty interesting team dynamic for a team that had never experienced this before. Like, we... You know, Mighty was formed on this idea of like everything's automated and you always see what's happening. But then all of a sudden, this magically appears at another studio of like, I just check something in and then this machine turned it on and it's there and I can see the game. And it became this really, you know, socially transformational situation within, within their office to the point where they actually like the, their other teams got really shitty that they didn't have it. So, <laughs> so, so what we, what we, the solution there was what we did was we actually built them a custom build machine that can handle the volume of, um, you know, console targets that they needed to hit for their publisher, for them, and then also for like all the platforms that have to go out. You got 22 build targets, there are, um, 
there's about 50 builds a day and so far as of like nearly a month or like a couple of weeks ago we've done like 4100 builds right. for them it's probably what we're talking really quickly so chop chop was one of the first like mighty kingdom came to us sort of early this year um they had seen our test wall and they'd seen the test bots we've just been doing it internally um they said look we'd love to to have this for our chop chop for all the reasons Matt just said. And so that basically forced us to sort of basically do all the things you're seeing here and sort of take our test bot, which is really just a bunch of code we always had in our repos that ran stuff and sort of pulled out and make it a sort of a thing. So I'll, I'll qu quickly talk about sort of the structure of how the auto tester works and, and all that stuff. So, so basically what it is, um, I don't think we have any good slides for this because there's no really good way to, pick, anyway, it's not important. Um, so basically what it, what it is now is this little tiny chunk of code, right, that can just do stuff in your game, right? It can move the mouse, it can click buttons, it can, look at things, it can, it can pretend like it's a controller, whatever. So it's basically just, it's just an input simulator, right? Um, and what it does is basically when it, so when your builds come in, we're making builds for iOS, we're making them for PS4, we're making them for Switch, whatever, and then we'll make a test bot build, which we'll take your build, and we actually take our test bot code and just stick it into your, into your repo. It sort of is all static, it lives there, it doesn't need to actually access your code generally, although sometimes we do reflection, but whatever. Um, and then the other thing we, that we do is part of the sort of test bot process is we sort of pre-process all of your code and basically go through and, um, who here is familiar with the term monkey patching? From like old object-oriented stuff. Well, you can't do that with C-sharp, so we have this thing called monkey smashing, which is where we actually go through and like Perl regex your... No, 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 no. It's, it's not that bad. Yeah, right. it, no, it's terrible. Um, it's, it's, it's like monkey, monkey, monkey patching, but basically we're going through, we're basically finding things like, oh, you know, I want to be able to call, you know, I want to be able to buy something on an IAP. Well, I can't do that, so I basically just find that piece of code and I turn it into a stub, you know, so that there's, there's, there's a whole class of things that you don't want the test bots to do because they're bad for testing. So we basically just go through all your entire code base and just force your code to stub out in those places so they don't get called out. So you don't have to worry about like the test bot trying to buy things or if you want, don't, if you don't want like, you know, our 80 months of testing to smash your analytics, we just stub that out and turn it off. So that's sort of one step in the process. We go through your code and basically like neutralize it for all the bad things that it can do. It, 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 <laughs> just, just to get that conceptually right, this occurs at build time. Right. It never touches your repo. Right. That's the so important. Yeah, the it important is thing never is checked into <laughs> your game. Yeah. All right. So it's, it's like it's, it's, it's a read only. We read from your repo. <clears throat> we smash it. We stick our code in there, and then we build it. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, that basically allows us to also do things like run multiple instances. You know, I can I can stub out all your save games so they go to places where I want them to go. I can stub out your player prefs so they go to like a place where we can hold on to it. So I can run nine instances of Unity at once and the save files and the prefs don't smash each other, right? Um, so we have a, just a stack of all these sort of internal tools that basically like replace Unity processes and stub them out so we can basically control that and sort of have instances so that to your code, it looks like one instance is running, but really we're running five or nine or 10 or you know, what, however many. Um, so that happens and then once the, once the code is running, what it does, it basically goes and looks for the AI routes, we call it, right? Um, so the, the, the AI that runs your game is sort of this sort of old school, it's just decision trees with a whole bunch of ra randomness thrown in, right? And so the first thing we do is we try to get the, the sort of soak test going, which is, you know, probably 95% of your game is gonna be UI, pressing buttons, doing things, getting stuck in menus, right? And there's probably like 5% that's like actually playing your specific game, you know? So like for Piffle that is like, how do I break blocks, you know? For Chop Chop it was super complicated, and it was probably a good game to be our first game because it was four players, so we actually had to have four auto tester, you know, personalities running at once, and they all sort of had to know about each other and things. So it was, a, it was super interesting to get that working. But basically, the idea, the idea is, the game fires up, it goes up to our sort of, you know, our S3 bucket, pulls down the routes, which is basically just a markup text file, and then basically starts running. You know, and it's basically a half second loop. <coughs> ish, half second or less or more, depending on what you're doing. Um, basically just every, every half second or so, it basically looks into your game and goes, what, where am I? What is the game state right now? Am I in a menu? Am I in the city? Am I yeah. trying to break blocks? What am I doing? And then it does one thing. It'll do a drag or a release or a button press or whatever, and then it starts over again, right? Just like sits there and analyzes the ennui of yeah. your game. Yeah, So with Chop Chop's interesting, there was actually four of those running at once. We used to have four threads running at once all the time with four different controllers trying to fuck up each other. And it was actually really good because, um, one thing they'd never really tested was the idea of like, they got the menus and once you turn on menu, anybody can turn the menu off. <laughs> so the test bots would turn the menus on and off all the time, like literally 10 times a second and it would just break everything. So they had to fix that, so that was good. So there's all sorts of weird behavioral things that come out of that that were really good for them and for us. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm just trying to make up, get tons of, okay, go. We've got to get to the questions, right. Okay. <laughs> so, so 
what we what we've actually started doing now is like um, you know Mighty Kingdom have us uh, you know it's very confusing because we're both companies called Mighty, Mighty. but that's cool. Uh, we're friendly. Um, yeah, we are not Mighty Kingdom. We're Mighty Games. You would have figured that out. But anyway, so what we, we're on retainer for them now, and we're actually starting to build out this for their entire pipeline. So um, where we have, uh, you know, on to, to, the, to the right here, you know, that's Chop Chop. It's like, well, their, their, their other game is actually coming through, and it's all mobile-based, and it's, it's reusing all these existing pipelines and these exist, this existing hardware that they've got. And uh, I also asked Phil for, I asked Phil for a quote for NZGDC. So uh, it was like, working with Mighty Games has transformed the way we make games. The tools and expertise provided allows for developers to spend more time focusing on the games and less wrestling with certificates. And then he just goes and says how wonderful everything is and say hi to New Zealand. So hi, New Zealand. Hi. Right. <clears throat> um, so <laughs> just always get a not contextual quote when you need to use a quote for a talk. That's, that's, my, that's my advice. Um, so, that's the chat. And it's a little sales pitchy. A little and bit. Huh. It's a little like, hey, these guys are just trying to sell me some shit. And I'm like, yeah, we are. So, look, <laughs> this, th th this is the deal. Building is incredibly boring. Not only that, everyone in this room has done it. And more than likely, you've solved this problem, right? Awesome. Testing is also just like, horrifically intensive to the point where it actually just gets avoided, right? Like, like the, the complication is ridiculous. The number of platforms is ridiculous. The complication in your game is also ridiculous. How do you play everything? How do you do everything? It's, it's like throw more bodies at it is usually the solution. Or just don't do it, which is the other solution. Yeah. Um, so look, we do this now. We're happy to do this for you. Uh, come and have a chat. Any questions? Yo, oh, wait, we gotta wait. You oh, hold on. Microphone. Yeah. yeah, get that mic. Where's the mic? Ben, get the mic. You're closer. I, what, what are you I, doing? Just get the I, mic. I, I <laughs> you worked in the film industry. You know how to use a mic. Uh, I'll, I'll let the pros do it. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I kind of have two quick ish questions. Um, number one, uh, looking through your test spot thing there, at one point it um, had the Vive and Oculus logos. So how do you test that? <laughs> right, so um, you want to go? Yeah, let me do this okay. one. You were talking for ages. Whatever. Um, so uh, we're currently making a VR game. And, uh, it'll come be, see it in the indie booth on yeah, Friday. It's, uh, come, come to PAX. It'll be at the indie booth. Shooty VR. It's great. Now, he, he, here's the thing. The solution here is that what, we've, what we did was that instead of thinking about it in the terms of like we simulate input, that's all we have to think about. It's like, well, actually, we have to simulate the camera position. Right? Which is just another input, really. So it's just about simulating more inputs fundamentally. Yeah. So if you like abstract out the problem, like the head is somewhere and the hands are somewhere and they're like smashing buttons. So at that point, it's like, great. All we, all, once, once you abstract the problem, it's a pretty easy solution. We just need like we need a simulated camera that just does something, and then we need like hands that then go and do something. And you know, as we have always found, the stupider the testing is, the better for the testing. So 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 it's like, even though you think, oh, we need this like, oh, we need something really sophisticated, like a mannequin on a thing. It's like, nah, you just have this like <laughs> random camera like looking at stuff, and then just like big fingers like hitting things and you're, you're good to go. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting because we, we first, because like Shooty, the original Shooty, which is a shmup, we originally started the test bot on that a million years ago. And like, we, I tried it, I made it smart enough to play the game really well, which didn't work very good um, because it would play the game the way I understood how the game would be played. And so it didn't actually find a lot of the edge cases that we wouldn't have found already. Um, so we did find, like Matt was saying, that the bots have to be smart enough to know how to, how to deal with your game loop, right? And that's the 5% we're talking about. The 5% of the game we had to write specific for the VR was head input, hand input, right? And then some sort of somewhat awareness of what you're shooting at, so, you know, so it can progress. Yeah. But if you make it too smart, it's just gonna play the game like you play it and not find the edges. So we, we, we tend to make the bots a bit stupid when we can. Um, quite stupid often. Yeah, often. I mean, we usually start quite stupid, you know, like it's, it's, you know, random, it's very random, but directed based on the game state, and then enough smart enough to, to like progress a little bit. Uh, but with like Piffle, for instance, um, we couldn't, 
it couldn't get past like level 50, so we actually had to go through and make a smart version of it. So now we run two versions. We run the dumb version and the smart version, so we can get sort of all the, all that stuff. Yeah. So. And your second question. Uh, the second question is much shorter. Um, so all of your um, build bot and stuff uh, ping Slack. Now, um, I've worked with companies that use Slack, but I've also worked with companies that use Discord. Absolutely. So would you yeah, yeah. do a that's, Discord that's version? That's fine. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, it pings Slack because we use Slack, but... Adding, I mean, because because of the way it's, it's basically it's all modular. It's like everything else these days. You know, it's all modular. It's all microservices, web, blah blah, AWS, whatever. So you want us to hook into whatever we can hook into it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So many questions. Hi. Uh, when you're mocking or monkey smashing, monkey parts smashing, of yes. Your games. You're obviously uh, losing the ability to test certain behaviors. Absolutely. In the game. Yeah. Is the test bot able to turn turn that off and? Uh, just run, say, one instance as it would uh, natively. Win. Yeah, yeah. So, like, like the, the, so all, everything, because we're all about web configuration, everything's configurable. So I can, I can smash certain type. I can be like, fake IAPs only. We want to smash those out. But leave it like, analytics, turn everything else on. You know, let, let the test bot change resolution and quit, right? Which is the problem we actually had with uh, Chop Chop. It's like, it was running great for, for like a month, and then they added the ability to switch resolutions on our thing, and then the test bot changed it to a resolution that was too small and then quit. <laughs> sort of like, okay, I gotta monkey smash that out. So yeah, it's all configurable, uh, but you do bring up a good point, this idea of like, the test bots are really great at testing a certain class of defects, right? They're incredibly good at finding your edges, crashes, just massive coverage, but they don't replace people, right? Like, they're a tool for your QA team and your whole production team, really, to sort of uh, leverage your creativity, right? It's like, it takes, the, the idea of the test bots is it takes away the tedium of like 95% of the defects that it can find. There's a ton of stuff it can't find. Um, stuff we smash out, you can't find that. If it doesn't work, we've stubbed it out. You won't know. Uh, there's lots of on-device things you can't do. Like I can't have it, no matter how good I make the test bot without like a you know hot dog on a stick. I can't make IAPs on a, on the iPhone. You got to test that yourself. Things like that. So we we, we have we have spent that. time on the hot dog on a robot arm, like with touch, a camera with a camera touching the screen. So like if someone is keen. We would be keen if to If you got the research dollars, we'll be that for you. But yeah, so like, yeah. there is, like I said, there's a certain class of bugs that's very good at finding and very good at uncovering and very good at, at revealing to you, but there's a certain class that you're just going to Humans got to play, like it doesn't know if it's a game's fun. Maybe your game's frustrating. I don't know. The test bot doesn't know that. Yeah. It'll happily smash against a level that's impossible to play forever. Yeah. So you still have to figure that out. Yeah. Hey, so... Um, I worked on a similar tool for a project a while ago uh, to the test bot, um, but like simulates inputs, and I was basically doing a log of uh, a run through of a game, recording all the inputs and trying to play it back. And I ran into some pretty big issues with uh, timing for physics. So obviously that wouldn't be a problem with a game that's mostly like text-based or dialogue-based. Uh, but do you have systems for handling that, I guess, like, Cumulative error of like if the timing is a slightly different. Well, no. See, the, <coughs> the, yeah, there's no timing involved because it's yeah. It just it does this thing and then it just mm, sleeps just for a half second and then goes right. What happened? Yeah. Oh, I gotta do this. Yeah. And the and the other thing is that the the, the, the tests are not like uh, it's not deterministic. So what you you're not, you're not running the same test all the time. You're actually just like oh, what state am I in? Do this random thing. Yeah. And then so from that you know the the, the advantage there is that. Every single test is slightly different, and then the, the the value is in massive coverage. You just you just want tons of instances that will expose to you all of all of the varying problems that yeah f your, your physics system is going to hit. Like yeah. if you if your whole game is built on like a deck of cards physics system, then it's like you actually just want to beat the living hell out of it with lots and lots of testing, so you can find all those edge cases that'll then. Sort yeah. that out. And that's sort of part of the sort of the five percent of AI bit. Like let's say you're it's like Mario Tennis, and the test bot has to understand where the ball is so it can hit it, right? So we'll just write the code in, you know, either through reflection or we'll, you know, we'll get with you guys to basically make a little thing in in your game that can tell us some information we need to do that, right? Yeah. And then we'll just sort of wrap the test bot or make that one of the test bot inputs that's like, you know, hit the ball that's coming in or don't, or do a random thing, or you know, the way there's there's ra like every single command the test bot has like a tweakable randomness value. So it can be like, I want this to be more random or less random. You know, so I can actually do things that are, it's never, never deterministic, but I can actually run set things like do this, 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 and this, and tell me what happened. Uh, for like, if you want, you can do validation testing, that's fine. Um, but we also have those like, do those five things, but slush them about a little bit, you know. 
Right, right. So it's less about like uh, running a deterministic set of actions and seeing if it did exactly what you expect, more about just doing a whole lot of stuff yeah. and seeing yeah. where it crashes. And because, because we're running inside your game, we have access to the state. So if it's a physics-based thing, if there's, something, if there's colliders coming at me, I can see what they are and I can react to them. Um, oh. You know, I, I to write, someone's got to write that code is all. So that's part of the like, that 5% that of the core loop of your game that's going to be custom to your game is like, it needs to understand where the tennis ball is yeah. so it can I mean, you know, that, that being said, if, the, you know, if there's all, there is that situation where it's like if there's a particular use case of like we always have to do X, Y, and Z and have the, you know, A is the outcome, you know, that's totally a testable solution. Like you can yeah. go, right, do this thing, did it happen? And we did that, like, we, you know, we did that for Piffle. Like we had these situations where it's like this has to happen, great. But that's not the build, that's not the test you run all the time. That's the test that you run to go, well, did it work? Yes or no? Great. Okay. Now just do 10,000 instances and run yeah. the rest. So, yeah. I mean, oftentimes, like, you know, those things are really, really handy. Like, so we had that before where it's like, we got a new event, drop the event in, hit the play the event button. You have to play the event and get the thing out at the end. If yeah. that doesn't work, something's wrong. I mean, um, it, it does fall into that whole, that whole concept of like unit testing in your code and all that kind of stuff. Like, that is great, but... You should be doing that. You should be doing that. We don't do that for you. Good on you. We'll run it for you. But but you, but if you if you think of the game is a giant unit, <laughs> like like I, I you know this thing turns on and then I have to hit the thing and it doesn't break right it's like I I I'm a person with filthy hands and I'm just gonna smash that touchscreen and see what occurs like and the game can't break and that's like that's a really difficult like replicatable unit test so the only way to do that is like just like Throw tons at it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Norris. Too many for now. But pick someone. You pick. <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned that it's pretty much random how it builds this stuff. Um, how do you deal with the issue that when you're building these proof sheets, you want to see every piece of text, so particularly something like NeoCab, if all these build engines are completely random? Yeah. And don't coordinate with each, with each other. Oh, that's easy. That's easy. So, so, so <laughs> the, the solution there is like, we're going to take it. We're going to take an image when there's a string on the screen. So, a, I know there's a string on the screen. B, I know what its what um, string is. What the string was, right? So I can take that screenshot and I can throw it in a folder. That's like, th this is that string's bucket. Right? And then from that, it's like we, can, we just make these folder trees of like, uh, you know, we were talking to this person and they said this thing. And that like, like as the screenshots happen across like, like these 24 different instances, they're all going into the same buckets. Yeah, and they're all tagged. It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, the, ride, the, the, you know, the level, it's like level ride, the passenger name, the string. You know, this is like, like five or six different vectors we tagged every, every yeah. image with. So we can guarantee that like, we, we, we had one of everything, or as many as we can. Like, as you mentioned, it is, with NeoCam was problematic because, because we came in so late to the project, we didn't have the ability to basically go in and put in code that could basically create every string. With Piffle, because it was ours, we actually created, it was a deterministic, hit a button, 30 minutes later, every string was out of it. Because I could just run through, I could just bring yeah. everything, it's like, I know where they all are. I, had, I just wrote the, these big scripts that basically just generated them all. With NeoCam, we didn't have that, so we had to do this sort of Monte Carlo, where it's like, we're just gonna brute force it, baby. We're just gonna smash as much as we can, and you know, like we'll just solve this problem with our power bill. So it's fine. yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. you know, and yeah. So like, in in a twenty four hour period, we actually might only get ninety eight percent of the things, but over the course of three weeks, we you'll get yeah. You'll end up seeing everything yeah. at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was with NeoCab. It was a bit of like I sat down and I actually tried to write a bunch of stuff that would guarantee we could get them all out, and it just was problematic because just you know. Yeah. Whatever. Um, so this is what we came with the brute force method. Just like, well, I can write a, I can write an AI script that just does it, you know. And then we just throw hardware at it. Yeah. Brute force is the best force. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's fine. <laughs> anyway, we're around. Ask us questions. We'll be outside. Yep. Let's talk.